you. Um, what I will do today is to talk uh, uh, about the role of representations and more broadly of signs uh, in mathematics. So I'm afraid I will not say much about the role of axiomatization. Instead, I will focus more on the role of notations and more in general uh, external cognitive tools. So I'm happy that, uh, that this issue has come up in some of the talks before me. Um, and the kind of role they can have uh, both in shaping mathematical reasoning and eventually mathematical results. Um, I will start from two quotations illustrating how I got the idea of this talk. Uh, I owe the first quotation to, um, to the group of mathematicians and philosophers that I had uh, the pleasure to work with in Nancy last year, and in particular to Philippe Lombard. Um, and the quotation comes from a recent interview to the French mathematician Alain Con, and this is uh, totally in line with your talk, because what he's, he's talking about doubles theory, and, uh, uh, and I quote in French from the video, uh, cette machine à café, uh, the doubles theory, elle est prête à servir, elle est, elle est bien chauffée, c'est extraordinaire de voir qu'il y a une manière de faire deux mathématiques qui maintenant, justement, À partir du moment où on met les bons ingrédients, on a presque une aide à la pensée qui est merveilleuse, qui donne les bons problèmes et qui donne les bonnes questions. Et donc, mon... Euh, ah, yeah, English. <laughs> my, my, my question was really to try to understand what does it mean that uh, something like a formalism can be, can be a tool for thought. And this idea of a tool for thought will uh, come back uh, a lot in the talk. The second quotation comes from... Uh, um, instead from a recent introduction to philosophy of mathematics, uh, written by Mark Coleman, in which he devotes uh, one whole, even if unfortunately very brief, uh, uh, chapter to uh, notation. Uh, this is the, as you see, there is some Shakespearean uh, uh, flavor here, and of course there is this issue of uh, comparing mathematics and poetry, in a sense, but I won't go into that. Um, the, interest, the interesting point uh, uh, is that he talks about uh, uh, topology and a particular kind of notation in topology, which has been also the subject of my recent work with uh, Sylvia de Toffoli, and so I will say something about that later. Um, and according to Colliman, in topology we find a, a very good notation which is composed of the squares with arrows, where the arrows drawn on them indicates the gluings, uh, that is the um, homomorphism. So for example, to give you uh, an example of a construction, think of the torus, because before going into that, uh, I'll give you a simpler example. So think of uh, this diagram. So here you have a square, which is a surface um, that is uh, uh, that it, with these arrows that are, in fact, uh, uh, indicated the homomorphism. So you can choose to uh, glue, let's say, the uh, two of the uh, of its uh, sides uh, in the same direction, and you will obtain a cylinder. So this is what, basically, the notation is telling you. You can also choose to uh, note that you can also choose to uh, glue the sides of the, uh, of the square in the opposite direction, and you will get uh, a Morbius band if you do that. So this is uh, uh, just a simple example. In order to get uh, uh, the torus, uh, you can uh, uh, first uh, you can identify the squares in pairs. So first you identify them in the same direction, and you get to the cylinder. And then you identify them in the same direction again, and you get to the torus where you, with the marks, uh, are in fact indicated the gluings. So this is the notation that is used, and uh, Kalinan takes into consideration this notation and says, and I'm quoting. This algebraic topology notation is something of a halfway house between pure algebra and pure geometry. It is both notation and a kind of blueprint for construction of the objects in question. So the first seems to belong to algebra, while the second is geometric. But whichever way you look at it, we have a powerful piece of notation here that does some genuine mathematical work for us. So again, there is this idea uh, that uh, there is a notation doing some genuine mathematical work for us, uh, helping <coughs> thinking. Um, let me mention that, of course, uh, the visual presentation of the torus can be formalized uh, in such a way as a portion. Uh, well, I think that you will agree that uh, this formalization does not do uh, the same genuine work 
mathematical work, of, all, of course it does something, uh, <laughs> but uh, especially without considering the corresponding visualization, it will be kind of useful, useless as a, as a genuine uh, tool for Tom. Um, and also something else that I want to, uh, that I want to, to you to pay attention to is, uh, again, going back to what Kalinani says, says, uh, so think of uh, uh, these other diagrams. So if we use this other diagram and identify two sides in the same direction and the other two in the opposite direction, we obtain a very interesting object, which is the Klein bottle, um, which is, as you may know, it's three-dimensional, but needs four spatial dimensions for its constructions and has no inside and no outside. And in Collivan views, uh, it is thanks to it is thanks to this diagram that, precisely because we had this kind of notation that we get we conceive the Klein bottle in a sense. So his idea is that uh, um, it is thanks to this notation that we can make uh, so it's not only a genuine uh, a, a good tool, but also it can help us uh, make new and in a sense unexpected objects emerge. And therefore, according to him, a good notation is far from being trivial, since it makes a genuine mathematical work for us, not only because it facilitates calculation, but also because it plays a role in prompting new ideas and inducing new developments in mathematics. So there is a sense in which maybe mathematic developments in mathematics are driven by the notation that is used. So, uh, I, as I said, I really wanted to understand what E de la Pensée meant uh, and also what this genuine uh, cognitive tool uh, means. Uh, so I tried to reformulate the question in uh, an interdisciplinary question, uh, uh, sorry, fashion. Uh, so my question would be, what does it mean that external material presentations can do a genuine mathematical work for us? So I'm really trying to go into these cognitive aspects that we mentioned uh, this morning. and. Uh, I wasn't sure, uh, I don't know, I, I thought that maybe um, some of you would uh, think that things like empirical results are kind of off topic when you're thinking uh, of mathematics. I was sure that at least two in the audience uh, would agree with me, but uh, I, I... At least two agree. At least two agree. At least one doesn't. Uh, but, uh, but uh, what I, I really think that when you're thinking about mathematical reasoning, it's, uh, it's really, I'm saying that cognitive science can say uh, all, but it can at least uh, give some more elements to add to the picture. So uh, my path will be the following. First of all, let me point, it, point out that it's, it's a path, because I'm just uh, trying to define uh, the possible line of research uh, for a cognitive semiotics for mathematics. and. Uh, as I said, it is, this is why I have uh, two words in my title, so this is a, a kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to define what, uh, what I'm interested in. So why uh, semiotics? Uh, because uh, I will talk about the role of notations and more in general of science, as I said, and writing in mathematics, and the possibility also of considering them as constitutive, if not of the very object mathematics is about, at least of the way in which we understand them. Why cognitive? Uh, well, I would say for two reasons. First, because as I said, uh, I will refer to some views uh, uh, coming from cognitive science. And second, because I will try to go deep into the consideration of these cognitive constraints we mentioned this, uh, this morning. So uh, how the way in which we use notations and external cognitive tools in mathematics and how this use is affected by other cognitive capacities which precede mathematics and are related to the interaction with concrete world, with the concrete world of objects, such as our cognition of space, uh, that for me is very important, and uh, our motor capacities in action. And that uh, was comment uh, just before about math theory, and I <laughs> think that I will say something about that. Uh, so the outline of uh, the talk is the following. First of all, I, I, will, I will say something about this distinction. I'm against the distinction visual versus uh, linguistic. I think it's uh, not helpful. Um, then I will say something about the possible cognitive framework. Uh, so I will zoom out and try to, to see what is embedded and what the extended uh, issue is about. Then I will consider representations. When I say representations, I, I always mean, mean uh, external uh, material representations, physical objects in a sense, and their relation to space and to writing. 
And then I will talk about another element that I think is very important when you when we think uh, of diagrammatic reasoning, as you will see. For me, diagrammatic reasoning is a lot of things. So um, that is the action, uh, the aspect of acting and manipulating the representations. And then, as a conclusion, I will give the, the very tentative big picture that I would like to work on. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, sketchy and uh, has to do not only in particular with mathematics, but I think that we might say something interesting about mathematics. Um, so, as I said, concerning the sharp distinction, I, 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 as I said, I find it misleading to approach representations in mathematics by distinguishing sharply between linguistic representation on the one end and the visual representation on the other. One reason, but this will become clear, is that I don't think it's vision that is involved when we talk about the not only, it's, it's not the, but I will say something later about that. So, uh, in my view, uh, vision reasoning cannot be considered in isolation from sentential reasoning and vice versa, uh, but I know that the, the, uh, this other direction is kind of uh, more controversial. Um, and as some authors have proposed, and she's a logician, so human reasoning has to be considered as heterogeneous, and different representation of formats play different roles in announcing human inference by, and they interact repeatedly, and it's the interaction that is interesting, so that's why it makes no sense to really look at them uh, uh, linguistic reasoning and visual reasoning in isolation one from the other. Um, my suggestion is to consider other kinds of distinctions that are more interesting, like uh, the one that, uh, so today also Simon was uh, quoted, and I'm quoting him again, um, for example, the distinction between informational equivalence and computational difference, and I think that this has to do also with some, some things related to design. So this was it's coming from a, a famous article of, by Larkin and Simon, 1987, and where they give as an example uh, the pulley problem, a physical pulley. So uh, they first use uh, to, to one uh, first format uh, that they use to, to describe the pulley is a uh, a linguistic form. So they say we have three pulleys, two weights and some ropes arranged as follows. The first weight is suspended from the left end of a rope over pulley A, the right hand of this rope is attached to and partially supports the second weight. So I, I'm looking at you to try to understand what you're doing while, while you're reading <laughs> this kind of thing. Because of course the same information can be displayed by diagram and I think that everyone reading the description would kind of uh, to make sense of it, uh, had to imagine something like that. So according to the authors, uh, the two representations are the linguistic description and the diagram are to be considered as informationally equivalent because they happen to have the same content, because the statements in the description express the same information that is displayed by the arrangement of the elements of the diagram. However, imagine solving uh, a problem concerning the pulley system. So, for example, someone is asked uh, uh, what the ratio of the second weight to the first would be when the system is in equilibrium. So, of course, you need some extra information. You need to know that, for example, the pulleys and ropes are weightless, for example. But at this point, uh, in order to solve the problem, anyone who reads the description, and this was kind of proven, without any being shown the diagram, would very spontaneously reach for paper and pencil <laughs> and draw a diagram based on the description, obtain something, something similar to the figure that you see. The point is that it's much more easier to extract the information about the pulley system by looking at the diagram than it is by reading a, the linguistic description. So despite being informationally equivalent, the two representations are therefore computationally different. And the question then to ask, the really interesting question is to ask is why the diagram's features make it, make, what are, what are the diagram's features that make this computational difference? So I think that this is uh, the kind of, uh, of picture that, kind of approach that I think is interesting when we think about diagrams. And of course, uh, Larkin and Simon has the suggestions, so have the suggestions, so they, they think that differently from the linguistic description, the diagram allows for the information at one location or close to it to be simultaneously accessed and presented. So for this reason, the search for the relevant information takes shorter time. Uh, and, thus it's what, and this is what facilitates computation. Uh, note that in some sense, both the linguistic description and the diagram 
externalize information about the police system, so they put it out there. There is a sense in which uh, maybe we could think that there were some diagrammatic aspects also in the in the list, uh, in the ordered list in which uh, the description was given. But still, those diagrammatic aspects were not enough. There was spa this, that spatial ordering was not enough to make it uh, a good computational tool. Um, and another thing to 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 remark, to note, is that both representations, and this is another important thing when you want to go against the visual linguistic description, is in both cases you need to interpret the representation. So this idea of visual being more direct, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's controversial because in a sense uh, uh, you have to understand the, the reference of the words in the description as well as you have to understand the, what these elements of the diagram talk about. So uh, there is a, there, there, this is an interpreted diagram, it's just, just a visual prompt. Um, so again, even if both are interpreted objects, the diagram seems to facilitate not only the search for the relevant objects, but also the recognition of the very objects that are involved in, in the reasoning. So let me clarify this point to how uh, one to in, intend diagram. Uh, in this context, for the moment, my assumption is that a diagram is a two-dimensional arrangement of uh, content, of information, which is a very vague and wide uh, definition, but it's a kind of operative definition. So, uh, as I said, there also to some extent, also the linguistic description had some kind, we can think that he had, had some kind of diagrammatic elements. Um, so, the point is that space matters and an appropriate spatial configuration can facilitate inference. So, in my, I'm starting from this idea that diagram-like representations externalize information in space in a relevant fashion, thus supporting reasoning and inference. Note that such Facilitation may also result from the interaction between different formats. For example, if you consider again the pulley systems, consider the role of labels here. Um, letters and numbers such as B, T, or W1 serve uh, there as indexes because they are placed in the appropriate spatial location so as to name the various element uh, of the diagram. And uh, uh, as Peirce has suggested, and I think that this is a very nice quotation, and I'm quoting, the index asserts nothing. It only says there, it takes hold of your eye, eyes, as it were, and forcibly directs them to a particular object, and then it stops. So in a sense, uh, uh, being symbolic, uh, letters and numbers have, <coughs> have nothing uh, in per se of di diagrammatic, but uh, in this indexicon function, uh, they guide the attention of the observer towards the relevant objects in the diagram, and they can do that precisely because, as Larkin and Simon claim, they are in the same location of close to these very objects. So again, it's a problem of function, it's a problem to go back to the idea of design, is the, the problem of how the diagram is used. Let me mention here that uh, I think that other uh, arguments can be given uh, to reject such a sharp distinction, visual, linguistic. So take, for example, specific diagrammatic practices, and uh, such as the use of diagrams in geometry, where something analogous to what we have just seen in, our, in my example uh, happens. So displaying the problem spatially helps recognizing uh, the relevant objects and find connections with previous background knowledge. So, of course, uh, the case of geometrical proofs and Euclidean proofs in particular is much more complex. Uh, I follow Nets. It's a beautiful book. I mean, I would recommend uh, <laughs> anyone to read it. It's a beautiful book, Nets. Book. And, uh, in fact, here, and I, I quote from Nets, uh, he says, uh, the perceived diagrams does not exhaust the geometrical object. This object is partly defined by a text. Example, given metric properties are textually defined, uh, but the properties of the perceived diagrams from, form a true subset of the real properties of the mathematical object, and this is why diagrams are good things to think with. I won't go into that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, done it elsewhere. I won't go to this too <laughs> painful issue about Euclidean diagrams, but still I want to, to point out that here again we find another, another case in which we can really distinguish the visual part and the uh, uh, we could think of a Euclidean proof as visual or as a statual in isolation one from uh, the other. Um, so based on this example, we can conclude uh, some, we can have some first conclusions. So we could think that diagrams are very good inferential shortcuts. Um, they are advantages from the point of view of uh, inference. 
By externalizing the information in space, they reduce the amount of search that is required to find the relevant information and solve the task. Again, they cannot be considered in isolation from a context they refer to, uh, which sometimes can be textually or linguistically defined. And the space of the diagram is an interpreted space in line with background knowledge, which is, as I just said, in some cases, textually given. And finally, it's pointless to consider them as visual tools in opposition to language. And this is my first conclusion. I, I think that this, this was some kind of preliminary observations that I wanted to start with. So the more appropriate question would be to think how, about how they can, since they are computationally advantageous, why is it so? How can they do? And we go back to the same question that I, we had at the beginning, how they can do a genuine cognitive work for us. So to answer to this question, as I said, I, instead of addressing diagrams and notations directly, I will try, kind of zoom out from them and consider what kind of theory about human cognition would be appropriate to defend the claim that diagrams are computationally, diagrams and notations, I mean, I, I'm, I'm using diagrams really in a very broad sense, are computationally effective because they externalize information in space. So in the recent philosophical, philosophy of mind literature, various hypotheses about the nature of our mind have been put forward that are possibly in line with the claim that reasoning is heterogeneous and that humans spontaneously refer to external cognitive tools, such as diagrams, in order to stack and work with information. For example, Varela, Var Varela has thought of uh, the mind as embodied. Uh, in other words, human cognition would be determined by various characteristics of the body, but I, I will say something about the, the body <laughs> later. Uh, Clark and Chalmers famously have thought of the have suggested that the mind is extended, uh, that is that the objects in the environment may assume functions that would make them become a genuine part of our mind. However, uh, despite being very inspiring, I think that these metaphors of the mind as an embodied extended are not enough when uh, it comes to clarifying in the practice what this means. Uh, for example, why we were able to create uh, and use these scaffolding structures that we use all the time to reason and to announce inference. So the crucial issue for me is clearly to define the kind of relation between these extensions of the mind and more spontaneous and precocious abilities, such as vision or action. Moreover, if the body has a role, well, I would like to know what kind of role it has, because sometimes it is evoked, uh, but it's not clear what kind of role it has in reasoning. Uh, note that I don't want to take up any particular metaphysical stance about the location of the mind, and I was happy that I, in your book you're saying the same thing, and like, I don't, I don't care. care. <laughs> But still, uh, I move more in a perspective that is, uh, that is very close to what Atkins is proposing in saying that cognition is not something that is happening in our head, but it's something that is distributed in many things, and the, the, the aspect of the distribution that interests me more and is the space, the fact that the, the cognition seems to be distributed in, in between an internal and an external, uh, let's say, uh, way. Um, so once we accept the claim the cognition is distributed, it remains to evaluate uh, the possible role of the body, uh, which is a problem, I think. So how much of my experience of having the body I have uh, would count for the way in which I do, for example, mathematics? Because for me, that's, that's not clear. And on this, I follow uh, Alvin Goldman, uh, who recently suggested of assuming a, a moderate approach to embody cognitive science. So if you consider things like proprioception or kinesthetics, which are the things that refer in the first place to the perception of the position and the movement of our limbs, um, well, according to Goldman, empirical studies show that human cognition is in fact, uh, can in fact be considered for the most part as embodied. Why? Because there are there is some information that is obtained normally from proprioception and kinesthetics, but it happens to be often reused for other uh, more abstract, abstract tasks. Um, so the, the empirical part of this uh, claim is that uh, uh, he think he assumes the existence of what he called 
bodily representation codes. So there, are, um, there is a subset of mental codes that are primarily or fundamentally applied in forming interoceptive or directive representations of one's, one's own bodily states and one's own bodily activity. And what he says, and this is the philosophical part of uh, the, the, the claim, and I think that this is uh, something very interesting that is coming up in many places in cognitive science, is that the brain reuses or redeploys some cognitive processes that at the beginning had the different original use, such as proprioception and kinesthetics, but he reuses this to solve new tasks in new context. And uh, uh, according to Goldman, when it comes to bodily representational codes, um, these appear to be extremely pervasive in cognition. So, uh, his proposal is a moderate conception of embodiment-oriented cognitive science precisely because it specifies the role of the body, uh, first by defining what bodily representational codes are, then of course is, there is empirical literature supporting that, but you can also be critical about it. Uh, so first, uh, first because it specifies the role of the body in cognition and uh, embodied representational codes, and also because it explains how they happen to have an influence on cognition, because it's our brain that does it for us. There are other approaches in country science that may be of interest for an account of diagrams in financial powers. I'm thinking of Barcelou, who has focused on the questions relative to the influence uh, that perception seems to have on cognition. So according to him, uh, standard theories in cognitive science think that core knowledge representations in cognition are a model data structures that get processed independently of the brain's model system, so things like uh, uh, perception, the model system for perception, so uh, vision audition for action, movement for introspection, internal perception of motivational states, and so on. And according to him, uh, and this is, I think is very interesting, also if you think of a parallel between the psychology and mathematics, maybe this was a result of the cognitive re revolution of the 50s, according to him, because according uh, to Barcelou, the some way paradoxical result of this revolution was that uh, imagery was banned uh, from psychology because it was not sufficiently scientific and therefore it had to be a rule out from human reasoning. And this attitude, according to him, and I'm almost quoting, was mainly due to the major developments that were taking place at the time in logic, linguistics, statistics, and programming languages. So as a consequence, Mental images were replaced by a model language like symbols that were deriving from predicate calculus and propositional logic. So, um, contrary to the standard view, uh, Marcelou suggests uh, that we should think of cognition as grounded. And in his view, there are things like model simulations or situated action and occasionally bodily states again that underlie it. And interestingly, Marcelou chooses the term grounded just to avoid embodied, and I find that this is uh, interesting because he says that he doesn't want to produce the mistaken assumption that rejecting the standard theories of cognition means necessarily claiming that bodily states are necessary for cognition and exclusively focusing on them, because there are cases where cognition still proceeds independently of the body, and uh, in a sense, uh, his idea is also that we shouldn't just uh, uh, throw away and reject standard theories. There are sense in which they still can be of interest, but uh, uh, they are the, the limits uh, should be uh, acknowledged. But still, we can think of cognition of both uh, of grounded, but also sometimes of going on uh, uh, working in ways that still remembers uh, a model uh, core knowledge, uh, a model data structure. Um, so. According to uh, Barcelou, uh, wish cognition would be based on perceptual symbol systems, which are modal and analogical, and uh, they are not holistic and not compositional, compositional static representations, but they are very dynamic and multimodal. And uh, if you want to know, he mentions Kant when he thinks about his perceptual symbol systems, then of course it's a kind of inspiration, but it's true that there is this idea of something like a schema, then you have to see how it works, of course. Um, and in Barcelona's view, so the, dissoci the dissociation, perception, cognition is artificial, is invalid, and perception and cognition share, share, according to him, common neural system, and therefore they function simultaneously and cannot be divorced. 
So if on one end we have Goldman, Goldman helping understand what is the role of the body, I think that Barcelou might, might be interested in, interesting for understanding what's the role of these kind of external cognitive artifacts and structures, for instance. But let me move, move now one step uh, back towards diagrams and notation and consider a more specific theory uh, about the role of imagery. So we are, we are imagery back to the picture. Uh, uh, imagery and space in reasoning. So as it is, I think, well known, Johnson Laird in the 80s has proposed this idea that uh, human reasoning uh, is based on mental models. So according to his theory, human reasoning is a mental simulation process in which models of the premises are constructed, inspected, validated. And in a very recent book, Knauf uh, proposed a uh, Another kind of variation on this theory, which he defines uh, the space to reason theory, um, according to which, okay, there, there are some assumptions that are shared uh, with Johnson Laird, but he's trying to make more clear cut hypothesis regarding the format in which the models would be, rep would be represented in the mind. And in Knauf's definition, mental models are non propositional, they transcend language, and they are spatial in nature. And the interesting point is, is that he says, and he, all of this is, uh, of course, there is some empirical work uh, behind all of this. So one one uh, thing that he says, and I think that it's very interesting, is that is this is not visual, visual, this is spatial. In fact, the visual images are not the basis of reasoning, and on the contrary, in some cases, they can even impede the process of inference. So what is important here is space to reason. And in fact, he says, uh, Let's go beyond the opposition between visual and sentential accounts of how the mind works, but and explore a third way, according to which uh, there are these supramodal spatial representations that are the art of cognition, of human cognition, and uh, most importantly, they are used even to think about non-spatial, uh, non-spatial relations that we might find, may find in the world. So these relations are effective to announce inference precisely because on the one hand they are more abstract, and this I think is a crucial point, on the one hand they are more abstract than visual images, but on the other hand they are more concrete than propositional representations. And most part of this book is devoted to, to give, uh, oh yes, this, to give uh, um, empirical evidence in favor of this claim. And I want to uh, mention that now theory recently has been considered in relation to Euclidean diagrammatic reasoning in a paper by Amami and Jamuma, where they say that uh, uh, a cognitive account of Euclidean diagrammatic reasoning, of course in a Mander style, uh, would be compatible with Knauss uh, uh, framework. In fact, as I have already mentioned, Euclidean diagrammatic reasoning is not supported by visual images alone, since one needs to postulate the cognitive representations of the spatial information contained in the premises of Euclidean diagrammatic inferences. And it is the space of the diagram that matters, not its visual appearance. So in this framework, I think there are the four reasons to think that diagrams can do a genuine cognitive work for us, because they are optimal tools exploiting space in an relevant matter, also in a dynamic way, referring to proprioception and kinesthetics, and thus creating this kind of scaffolding structure for our thoughts. But I want to focus now on another aspect that, it's, that characterizes diagrams, which is the nature of traces. So they are also drawn on a piece of paper or shown on a computer screen. And uh, the fact that diagrams uh, are traces allows, allow us to inspect, explore, and possibly change them, and then inspect and explore them again. So it is interesting, again, to zoom out from diagrams and consider this time a crucial aspect of human culture, that is the role of writing. Uh, of leaving meaningful traces, uh, and I will focus on one particular form of writing that <laughs> the Katharina's work about. Um, and here I come to anthropology, so this is another nice book, that, which is uh, Jack Goody, is The Power of the Written Tradition, so when he talks about orality in written cultures. Um, so according to him, uh, as has been proposed in anthropology, most of the aspects of linguistic communication in written cultures are heavily influenced, and in some cases even determined by writing, or by a variety of graphic representations, diagrams being among them. So yes, this example of uh, uh, Robinson Crusoe in, uh, in Defoe's uh, novel, and in fact he says that uh, once the protagonist finds pen, ink, and paper, he finally begins keeping things very exact, which means, some of, above all, telling the time. And there's a lot to say about space, time, and 
the representation of time that I won't go into that. Uh, so once we have pen, ink, and paper, we can do even better than simply write down markers and mimics uh, the kind of caps that we might have uh, carved on a piece of wood, because we can shift to abstract markers like letters, numerals, and this is a crucial improvement both for science and for daily life, and will influence not only, this is what Good is saying, not only the content of our exchanges, but also their very structure. And as Goody clarifies, although these changes are not directly due to writing per se, they are dependent upon uh, graphic or conceptual lines being drawn, and the drawing of lines is a basic graphic accomplishment. And he talks in particular of the mathematical table as something that is essentially the product of writing, but one that can be taught to or learned by uh, those who can neither read or write. And yet it provides those who use it with a special cognitive tool, a technology of the intellect. So again, we are in this idea of some of these the artifacts being a technology for the intellect. So let me now zoom in again on this cognitive technology and see in the practice how they can have an influence on our reasoning ability. And uh, uh, this would add another element to the kind of computational advantages of diagrams. And I quote here <laughs> Katerina's work. So in your recent and very inspiring book, I, uh, you offer an original analysis of the role of formal languages in logic. So their motivation was to embrace a wider conception of formal languages that would allow going beyond their alleged nature of mathematical objects and again investigate the, their main function, which is being a tool for thought. So you will back, back to this idea. So you, she starts from the question about what exactly goes on when someone uses formal language. And to reply to this question, she takes into account both the history of notations in logic and empirical results that support the view that condition is extended. So the for your book, uh, we have also a little resume now, so. Um, and also some publicity. Some? And also some publicity. <laughs> exactly. So from this point of view, I think we're clearly in the same line of thought, despite the fact that uh, uh, you use a lot of the literature on psychology of reasoning. Instead, I really want to go into spatial, space, spatial mm -hmm. representation, I think, for reasons that are clear by now. So uh, your claim is that formal languages uh, should be viewed as cognitive artifacts enhancing and modifying an agent, an agent's reasoning process. They are indispensable as calculative and computative devices, and they are crucially to rely on sensory motor processing. And you gave an example. Uh, as uh, you, she explains, their main goal is to consider historical as well as empirical data to the aim of reaching the conclusion that a formalism is a powerful technology uh, that allows humans to reason in ways that would be otherwise virtually beyond their reach. And in order to support your claim, uh, you just uh, refer, among other things, to the notion of the formal as desemantification, uh, which has been proposed by Kramer. And uh, in Kramer's view, formalism is in most cases uh, computationally convenient because it allows its user to remove or disregard from uh, it the semantic dimension of written science and to treat them as meaningless. And for this reason, formal language would be a particular form of writing, which is operative writing, because it is not only a tool for describing, but also a tool for cognizing, a technique for thinking that enhances intelligence. Um, you say, uh, yes, you gave, when you gave the, uh, your example, you said, for example, forget the real story, the point is just that you want to put this, yeah. the other, the other, uh, the other the side of The official story, actually, I think the real story is the moving around. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> but that's, but that's ex precisely the kind, of, so even in a very simple notation, you can have this kind of operative price. Um, okay, just to be sure that we are saying something that is still relevant for philosophy and mathematics, I'm, I'm going to quote Mac again <laughs> too. And uh, uh, her work on uh, her paper in philosophy and mathematics on paper and pencil reasoning, and where she says that signs in mathematics are not used merely to record results, but in contrast, their main function is to embody the relevant bits of mathematical reasoning. They put the reasoning itself before our eyes in a way that is simply impossible in written natural language. So here, there is also a con contrast between written natural language and formalism that is important. Um, Um, yes, as uh, we saw in the pulley problem example, the diagram puts the very reasoning about the pulley system before our eyes. 
So using Macbeth technique, the terminology notation shows how the reasoning goes, and this facilitates calculations, and their aim uh, in this paper is, um, uh, their claim in this paper is that mathematical science, such as, for example, a Euclidean diagram, do not only picture something, but formulate the content of something in a mathematical tractable way, in a way that enables reasoning in the systems of science again. Um, the, this very relevant aspect of the mathematical practice has been unfortunately uh, neglected by standard views of philosophy of mathematics. One reason, among others, could have been that too much attention was put on the supposed descriptive function of mathematical science as opposed to their creative function, as Rothman, in a book that, uh, I don't know, it's not perfect, but I think that some ideas are interesting, as he has, he has proposed, so he thinks that this has obscured the crucial importance in the practice of mathematics. And to recenter the discussion of what seems to be more relevant in this context, we can think of building a semiotics for mathematics. In Rothman's view, uh, thoughts and scribbles are mutually constitutive. He says the mathematicians at the same time think they scribbles and scribble their thoughts. And this is again related to writing, of uh, which we have already seen the constitutive, constitutive nature. However, the standard approaches of mathematics, and it is Rothman saying that, such as formalism, platonism, and intuitionism have failed to acknowledge the, the intricate interplay of imagining and symbolizing familiar on an everyday basis uh, to mathematicians with a practice, and mathematics is, first of all, a certain kind of traffic with symbols and written discourse. And this is what it's kind of suggesting. So if this is the right picture, then diagrams in particular, be them drawn or simply imagined, uh, and this is a quotation again from Rotman, is are the work of the body, they are created and maintained as entities and obtain significance only in relation to human visual kinetic present, only in relation to our experience of the culturally inflected work, world. As such, they not only introduce the historical contingency in their to all cultural activity, but also more to the present point, they call attention to the materiality of all science and of the corporality of those who manipulate them. So the, the body comes back uh, in this idea of the corporality and the materiality of the artifacts that we use. Since uh, we talk about the body, uh, there is a, I think that uh, some of you might be um, uh, familiar with this work that has been discussed a lot by Lacroix and Nunez, and this idea that uh, not only cognition, but uh, uh, mathematics in particular can be embody embodied. So what they think is that abstract mathematical com concepts uh, are rooted in embodied activities. Uh, previous, uh, uh, this, they base this uh, uh, work on previous researches on the role of metaphor in language. And they think that abstract scientific concepts, as well as ordinary ones, uh, can, conceive, can be thought of in terms of metaphors. For example, in the mathematical jargon, you use all the time terms like, uh, say, you say all the time things like natural numbers grow indefinitely, points lay, online function move to zero, but there's no function really moving to any place. But still, this is the kind of metaphors that are used all the time in mathematics. So according to them, conceptual metaphors and conceptual blending are the main cognitive mechanisms to conceptualize mathematical objects. The source, again, is bodily experience, and mathematics is embodied because it can, it can be understood and explained by making appeal to embodied cognitive mechanisms. And to give you an example, Sets are, can be container schemas, because they have an interior, a boundary, an exterior, with the entities inside the container being the elements of the set. And according to them, this is a grounding metaphor, which is frequently only implicit, used to conceptualize the mathematical notion of set, as determined by the Zermelo Franco axioms together with the axiom of choice. I see if you are not happy about this, this, this uh, idea of this as being a grounding metaphor for all of this, you can read <laughs> the paper on the limits of this interpretation when you look at it uh, historically. So you mentioned Matt's work as a, a good uh, way of uh, doing some kind of cognitive history uh, of some concepts. So we should do a cognitive history also of the container schema in a sense. Uh, but uh, I, I talked about this because I wanted to talk to you about a recent uh, uh, experimental work that I found. Uh, um, Basically, this is educational, mathematics education, so it's even worse than introducing psychology in philosophy of mathematics. 
So basically, uh, they, Sinclair and Goldtabagi were interested in uh, the way in which mathematicians make use of many heterogeneous representations, such as speech, gestures, and diagrams. And they interviewed six mathematicians and filmed them. Uh, and they were asked, uh, these mathematicians were asked uh, to explain the meaning of the mathematical concept eigenvector. And these are snapshots from uh, the videos. And basically, the interesting thing is that all of them, of course, know very well the formal manual definition of eigenvector, which is single, atemporal, and static. But nonetheless, with no exception, their descriptions include temporal and kinesthetic elements, as they show both in the terms they use and in the gestures that they use. Metaphors strike back because they talk of, ve they talk of vectors as uh, shrinking or turning, uh, and also they des describe the personalities of the vectors, so they go in the same direction, they align. I mean, these are all things that uh, are not present, no, no one of the mathematicians speak of.